Okay, so welcome everyone to um, tonight's Zoom talk. Uh, today we're, or to, this evening, we are discussing the um, anarchy of the, um, of the, uh, what would you call it? The anarchy of uh, <laughs> the years between, I don't know. <laughs> it's done horribly well. That's it's about 20 years span, isn't it? And um, so I'm going to introduce the panel. Um, and tonight we'll be talking, as I said, we're going to be discussing five candidates of who was the hero of the anarchy. And um, those talking about them will be Derek Burks. Um, Derek, would you, um, I'm going to introduce you. You're a first, you're a former teacher of history who claims to write action packed fiction and is in and accurate history. He began his writing career with um, Feud, the first of a series set in the late medieval peri period entitled The Wars of the Roses. Derek has also written the best-selling trilogy, The Last of the Romans, set largely in post-Roman 5th century Britain, which focuses on the real Romano British character of Ambrosius Aurelianus. Derek's current work in progress is a story set during the period known as the Anarchy, strange that, <laughs> and features a son of uh, Robert of Earl, of Earl of Gloucester, who he is actually talking about tonight. Um, Kathy, um, welcome Kathy. She's uh, an award-winning Amazon best-selling author of historical fiction, mystery, a dual timeline and romance set in Scotland, England and France. She was first published 11 years ago, but now all her novels are released under the banner of o Ocelot Press. An author cooperative she formed with a small number of um, author friends. Her latest release, Ascent, the story of Popper of Bayer, handfasted wife of Rollo the Viking is her sixth novel and it's very good I can tell you that um, and she's currently working on the sequel Treachery. Her House of Normandy series showcases the often overlooked women behind the famous warriors who forged early medieval Normandy um, and you can find Kathy across social media and at www.kathy.com um, oh, sing somebody. Um, and Carol, welcome Carol, Hi. following her, her first degree in Russian studies, English and history, Carol McGrath completed an MA in creative writing at the Seamus Haney Centre in Belfast, um, followed by an English, um, Oh, what's that? Enfield <laughs> from Enfield from University of London. She is the author of the Daughting, Daughters of Hastings <laughs> trilogy. I can tell you they're really good books. Her seventh historical novel, The Stone Rose, published by the Headline Group, set during the High Middle Ages, features Isabella of France. Carol also writes historical nonfiction for Pen and Sword, uh, Tudor Sex and Sexuality was published in 30, on the 30th of January, 2022. She is currently writing a novel about the anarchy as well. <laughs> We've mm -hmm. got some cheats here, I think, <laughs> to be published in May, the May 2023 and is already available um, on Amazon pre-order. You can visit her website at www.carolmcgrath.co.uk. Tony, um, welcome Hi. Tony. Tony Mount is a history teacher and author. She has written around 20 medieval fiction and non-fiction books and has an MA in history from the University of Kent. Her first non-fiction book, Everyday Life in Medieval London, was an Amazon bestseller, whilst historian and author Tony Richards says her latest medieval thriller, The Colour of Rubies, is a masterpiece of storytelling. <laughs> Tony says that at his lowest point, the county of Kent was the only region to stay loyal to King Stephen. So as Kent was a Kent resident, she thought she should stick up for him. Go, Tony. 
Um, and lastly, but not least, Sharon Bennett Connolly is the best-selling author of four non-fiction historical books, including Heroines of the Medieval World. She has two books coming out next year, Women of the Anarchy and a biography of Nicola de la Haye. Sharon was recently elected a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. She writes the popular history blog, www.historytheinterestingbits.com. Her TV work includes Australian television um, show, Who Do You Think You Are? Mm -hmm. you, you appeared on that, didn't you? I did. <laughs> you did, yes. Uh, and um, so, who was the hero of the anarchy? Now, each um, contestant, if you like, is going to be representing um, five characters from the um, historical period that we're talking about. Um, Derek will be representing Robert of Gloucester. Sharon will be representing Matilda de, uh, of Boulogne, who was Stephen's wife. Um, Carol is representing Brian de Fitz Count. And Tony, Tony's um, plumped for Stephen, as we heard earlier. Kathy um, will be um, fighting Matilda's, uh, or Queen Matilda's, Queen Matilda, Empress and Matilda's Empress. <laughs> uh, corner. Um, so there we have it. So we're going to open up, I'm going to open up the um, conference now, um, starting with Robert of Gloucester. So over to you, Derek. Well, good evening to everybody. And uh, can I say that uh, it's very, very nice to be here. And I'm the token man again, um, but I don't <laughs> mind. Um, Robert of Gloucester. Well, let's go back slightly in case anyone is not too sure what we're actually talking about. This thing called the anarchy or, or a period that's being called the anarchy is basically a war of succession. Uh, at the end of Henry I's reign in the 12th century, the middle of the 12th century. So it sounds unlikely to me that anyone can emerge from anything called the anarchy as a hero. And I'm sure what we'll find as we go through is that all of these figures in history have their faults and their failures, as well as their, their strengths. So my particular character is Robert Fitzroy, Earl of Gloucester. In fact, he's called by a number of names. But let's start off by saying that Robert's main claim to fame is that he is a bastard. He's not just any bastard, he's a royal bastard. And he was born before Henry I even became king. So he's the eldest son of King Henry I, but of course, he's illegitimate. Now, Robert is a favoured son. He's, he gets on very well at court. He's well educated. And crucially, he's given a magnificent marriage because in those days, marriage was extremely important to the, to the nobility and barons and so on. So he gets to marry uh, a lady called Mabel Fitz Harmon, who gives him masses of lands in Normandy, England, Wales, just about everywhere. And his father also makes him Earl of Gloucester to further increase his status and resources and so on. So this is an illegitimate uh, son who actually has a, a lot of clout in England at this time. Now, it's all going swimmingly for Henry I until 1120 when his only legitimate son dies in what we might call a boating accident, but perhaps that's uh, trivialising it a little bit. He, he managed to cross the channel almost. Um, didn't quite make it all the way across. And um, because he died, that gave, he that gave Henry a bit of a problem. He only had one other legitimate heir, his daughter Matilda. And he basically forced his barons to uh, swear an oath that Matilda would succeed him. They were a bit disgruntled about it, they weren't terribly, terribly keen on the idea, but it's notable that Robert, her half-brother, was one of the first to swear the oath. So perhaps that's either a sign of his aim to please his father or a sign that he genuinely supported his half-sister. 
So it, it seems that this, this young Robert was a man who, who had a genuine love and trust of his father, and it was mutual. They got on very well. Uh, he supported his father as a military commander and um, as an advisor. And when his father suddenly died in Normandy in 1135, Robert was at his side. Well, of course, that was the moment. The death of Henry I suddenly basically caught everyone with their trousers down, except one, perhaps. And Robert, I think, was in a bit of shock. Um, Matilda didn't make any particular move uh, to, to claim the throne. There may well be reasons for that, which, which others may mention. Why didn't Robert make a, a bid to put his sister on the throne? Well, basically, somebody else got there first. And I'm sure we'll hear a bit more about uh, how Stephen, Stephen of Blois, who was Robert's cousin, uh, made a, a drastic and quick move across the channel to take the throne. So Stephen becomes king and is generally accepted by most people. And within about four months of him taking the throne, even Robert uh, succumbs and says, OK, fair enough, I'll accept you as king. And at that point, you might argue that we wouldn't be talking about this at all, because there would be no civil war, there would be no attempt to put Matilda on the throne. But Robert is clearly not very happy. And in 1137, he, he withdraws to some extent from the court, um, partly because of a rather nasty incident that occurs in Normandy when um, he is ambushed by men ordered to do so by a chap called uh, William of Ypres. William of Ypres will probably crop up again. He's uh, regarded historically as a not very pleasant piece of work, and but he is Stephen's lieutenant. And it seems that Stephen perhaps was persuaded that Robert might be about to join his sister and as a result, they, they thought, well, let's, let's cut him off at the shoulders and uh, see if we can stop that and nip it in the bud. The, the ambush wasn't successful, but what it did was it persuaded Robert that clearly Stephen didn't trust him. And it certainly meant that he didn't trust Stephen. So from then on, we're really talking about Robert positioning himself so that he can uh, survive, if you like. And the only way to survive is to, to try and get Matilda in place of Stephen as the ruler of England. So that, that's where we're up to by about 1138. Um, now, what he does is he goes to Normandy and he says, right, everybody, I'm declaring for Matilda. She should be queen, etc., etc." And then like the firework that doesn't quite go off, he doesn't really get anywhere. He's, he's defeated in Normandy and... For, for the most part of a year, not really much, very much happens. Uh, certainly not, not anything positive. But then he comes to England in 1139. He brings Matilda. They sort of sneak into England because they haven't actually got, got an army with them exactly. But he starts to build support. And it turns out that his declaration has persuaded some others to join Matilda's cause. And they start sort of popping out of the woodwork when he actually gets there. So basically, Robert takes command of Matilda's uh, initiative uh, to get the throne. All he has is the southwest corner of, of England and not really all of that at, at this point. But in Christmas, 1140, all of that changes because Robert's son-in-law, the Earl of Chester, Ranulph of Chester, who is a very powerful, but also a rather volatile individual. He falls out with the king and suddenly Robert has a very powerful, powerful ally. And together they manage to take on Stephen and defeat him at the Battle of Lincoln. Now, essentially, all things being equal, that means Matilda has won. He's, Robert has handed Matilda England on a plate. It's only because she's not able to 
do what needs to be done as a leader. She, her, her charisma is not exactly uh, infectious and uh, she's not able to grasp that opportunity. So as a result, chaos ensues again. Uh, the, the royalist cause revive. I'm sure we'll hear a bit about that in a minute. And Robert is trapped with Matilda at Winchester. And typically of Robert, he has to try and get Matilda out in one piece. And to do so, he fights uh, a, a very heroic but also doomed rearguard. And while she escapes, more or less, by the skin of her teeth, he is captured. Now, of course, Matilda has Stephen in her possession. He's been defeated and captured. But without Robert, her campaign is nothing. And this shows you how important Robert is in this whole conflict. Without him, nothing can be done. He's so powerful, he says he's a great leader, he's a great military commander and strategist. So she's forced to give up Stephen in exchange for Robert. And we end up basically all square again. Well, that was a complete waste of time and lives, wasn't it, really? Uh, but there we are. So by about 1142, it's stalemate. We've spent all that time and this succession war is still not settled. Eric, you need to wind it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I am winding it up, actually. I know it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> so basically, over the next few years, Robert makes a desperate attempt to try and end this struggle. And in 1143, he almost repeats what he achieved at Lincoln, but Stephen manages in the nick of time just to escape. Um, after that, it's all uphill for the, the Angevin cause. Um, he tries to get support from Normandy, from, from Matilda's uh, absent husband, um, but he's not interested. And all he can do is bring over Matilda's young son, Henry, who at this point is of no use whatsoever. So Robert's desperate to try and solve matters. He, he takes a lot more risks. And in the end, in a desperate attack at Farnham, he's killed. Uh, sorry, well, he's wounded in 1147 and he subsequently dies. Now, for me, Robert is a, a tragic hero. He, he, for about 10 years, he tries to put his sister on the throne and fails ultimately. And his talents, which are very many, are completely wasted. So I think he's a hero in lots of ways, uh, not least for what he does for his sister. But I think that his talents were wasted and it's a great tragedy that such a man uh, was sort of buried in the anarchy. Well, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Derek. Um, yeah, it, you really put your co case forward really well there. Um, he does come across as, as a, a, you know, a great strategist and, um, a, you know, brave, courageous man. Uh, it's just a shame that he was illegitimate because he probably would have been um, the best of the bunch for to have taken the crown. But um, I forgot, uh, sorry, I'm not a very good host here, but I forgot to mention that the way that we are doing this this evening is that, um, as I said, each person is going to put forward the case for their um, particular candidate for the hero of the anarchy. And at the end of it, everyone will be able to um, ask questions and we'd like people to actually vote to, you know, for who they think put the case across uh, for whichever character. So um, we're also going to have split that um, competition, if you like, into who was best, um, who would have been the best, Matilda or Stephen, um, and the other one will be to say wh who was the actual hero. So uh, I hope that all makes sense. If not, ask me in the chat. <laughs> um, so next we have... Sharon, who's going to give the case for Matilda of Bologna? Um, I think that's how you say it, isn't it? Bol Bologna. Bologna, oh. Yeah, Bologna's in Italy. That's right, I <laughs> thought it was. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so take it away, Sharon. Thank you very much. Um, well done, Derek. Um, if I didn't have Matilda of Bologna, I probably would vote for Robert of Gloucester. He, he, he is a bit of a hero and very understated. 
But Matilda of Boulogne is also an understated hero. You hear of the exploits of Stephen and the heroism of Empress Matilda, but Queen Matilda is often relegated to the sidelines or left standing at the back. And as I was writing Women of the Anarchy, I discovered what a crucial role Queen Matilda played in Stephen's reign. In fact, as Derek mentioned about 1141, if it wasn't for Queen Matilda of Boulogne, Stephen would have lost his throne in 1141. But it was Matilda who, who um, managed to recover it for him. Now, Matilda of Boulogne, she was a daughter, the daughter of Eustace III, Count of Boulogne and Mary of Scotland. Mary of Scotland's older sister was Edith Matilda. She was originally called Edith. When she married Henry I, she changed her name to Matilda. So you, she ends up getting called Edith Matilda to distinguish her from all the other Matildas. And believe me, there were a lot of Matildas at that time which made writing a book about the anarchy very difficult in keeping all the Matildas where they should <coughs> be. Um, so you end up with Matilda of Boulogne and Empress Matilda in order to distinguish them. I don't use Maud, and you do see Empress Maud written quite a lot um, in some books, especially in fiction, but she never called herself Maud. The Empress was Empress Matilda. She wasn't Maud, so I stay away from Maud. Nobody at that time, I, as far as I can tell, used Maud. It's a nickname that came in later by writers rather than something that was used at the time. So Matilda Boulogne was the daughter of Mary Scotland and Eustace of Boulogne. So she was a first cousin of the Empress. And you know, they talk about the Wars of the Roses being the Cousins' Wars. Well, the anarchy was the Cousins' War. Empress Matilda was a first cousin of Matilda Boulogne and a first cousin of King Stephen. So this was definitely a war between cousins. Now, Matilda of Boulogne had been born around 1102, 1103. Uh, she married late for a 12th century woman. She married Stephen of Blois. And yes, I know I sound like I'm throwing up every time I say Blois, it just it never comes out right. But she and Stephen married in 1125. Shortly after the marriage, Eustace abdicated, retired to a monastery and died, leaving Stephen and Matilda as Count and Countess of Boulogne. Uh, Stephen also was Count of Mortain by that time as well, given to him by Henry I. So they had these vast counties to administer and they appear to have worked very much in partnership. Matilda was a strong, pious woman and had been raised, to, she'd been, she was an only child, so she was raised to play an active role in the government of Boulogne and she did it. She um, was very active in running, in keeping Boulogne loyal to Stephen and making sure that its own resources were available to Stephen in order for him to claim England. So when Stephen claimed the English throne, Matilda used her knowledge of continental politics, her control of a very effective fleet um, in Boulogne and of the Boulogne coastline to great advantage for Stephen to make sure that um, they were secured and held for Stephen. And she also secured mercenaries as um, Derek might have mentioned, led by her kinsman, William of Ypres, who supported Stephen throughout and was very effective um, military commander. So these, the backbone of Stephen's army was the resources that Matilda could give him. In, and she didn't just give him resources. In 1138, Queen Matilda, actually led a land force against Dover, which was holding out for the Empress, and um, using her Boulogne um, vassals to blockade by, by sea. She actually forced the garrison to surrender. Now, this is all she had given birth to a son, I think it was the year before or two years before. So she'd been, all this time, she's raising her children and supporting her husband, as we women do, or forced to do sometimes, actually. Um, so. Um, so that was 1138. Also in 1138, the Scots were defeated at the Battle of the Standard in North Allerton by um, the Bishop of Durham. And I think the Archbishop of York was there as well. Um, but after that, it was Queen Matilda herself who led the peace negotiations with her uncle, David of Scotland. And to secure David's support, Queen Matilda used this negotiations to bribe him with territory um, and she gave him lots of territory in northern England but then as we know people living in London rarely bother about what they're giving up in the north they're not bothered so but she gave him <laughs> I'm not 
bitter. <laughs> Being a northerner. So she gave him fast ways of Cumberland and Northumberland. And she also arranged the marriage of David's heir, son and heir, Henry, um, who married Ada de Warren. Now, Ada was the sister, she was the daughter of the Earl of Surrey and the, of the old Earl of Surrey and the sister of the current one. But she was also a half sister of the Beaumont twins, Wallerin and Robert, the Counts of Malone and Earl of Leicester, respectively, um, who were all keen supporters of Stephen's cause. So she was probably the highest ranking woman available at the time to give to Prince Henry as a bride. And um, Queen Matilda negotiated this marriage, um, took Henry then to meet his bride and was present for the wedding, and then escorted them part of the way back to Scotland because there was um, a plot to ambush them. Um, but Queen Matilda made sure that they got safely, the bridal couple got safely back to Scotland. She then brokered another marriage with her, between her son Eustace and Constance of France, the sister of Louis VII of France, thus gaining the support of the French king uh, against um, her, the Angevin enemies. Uh, 1140, she did. She and her brother-in-law, Henry of Blois, Bishop of Winchester, um, tried to negotiate peace between the warring factions, and they do seem to have come close, but it was eventually unsuccessful and um, hostilities resumed. Her greatest moment came in 1141. Well, her greatest year, really. It was not just one moment. Um, Stephen was captured at the Battle of Lincoln in February and his cause seemed lost. Matilda, made, Empress Matilda made a triumphant um, march through the country, going to Oxford, London, loads of places, showing herself and getting um, many of Stephen's battles to turn over to her side. Um, while she was doing this, Queen Matilda was in Kent, the power base of Stephen's forces, rallying the troops, um, trying to um, make a deal with um, the Empress. She offered, if, she, if the Empress would release Stephen, she offered that they would go into exile, um, give up the throne and just go into exile. Um, unfortunately for the Empress, she made one big mistake when Queen Matilda asked that seeing as she got Stephen, she, get, she would allow Eustace, her son, to inherit the county of Boulogne. The Empress refused. Now, this started a chain of events that turned her magnates against her, the Empress, because suddenly the laws of inheritance were being supersumed and sons may not inherit straight from their fathers. And that was a big thing in those days. Sons had to inherit their father's lands. It wasn't fair to um, confiscate lands from a family and to leave sons destitute. So suddenly people were seeing the Empress as the enemy again. And the Queen rallied the troops, um, offered, started, winning back these defecting magnates, including uh, Geoffrey de Mandeville, who was a mercurial chap at the best of times, but quite powerful. And she started a counterattack. The Empress was in London preparing for her coronation when Queen Matilda brought troops up from Kent, um, managed to persuade the disillusioned Londoners to rise up against the Empress, who was forced to flee the capital supposedly leaving her dinner untouched. Um, the attack was so such a surprise. And the Empress headed south of, to Winchester and Queen Matilda followed her with her troops, persuaded Henry of Blois, who, <gasps> I hate saying that word, why can't I just say Henry Bishop of Winchester, who had been on Stephen's side, changed to the Empress's side and announced the Empress as Lady of the English, but then Queen Matilda persuaded him back to his brother's cause. And Empress Matilda ended up besieging his palace at Winchester. Wolvesy Place, I think it's called, or Wolvesy Palace. So you have this incident in, in Winchester where the Bishop of Winchester's palace is being besieged by the Empress and suddenly Queen Matilda comes upon them and starts besieging the Empress. So you've got a siege within a siege. Um, 
the Empress has to retreat, um, leaving Robert of Gloucester to cover her retreat in the vanguard, and he gets captured by the Earl Warren's troops. So Queen Matilda suddenly has got Robert of Gloucester, and she has got a bargaining chip in order to arrange for Stephen's freedom. And the actual arrangements of the release are, right, are quite complicated in that each side has to give hostages in order to guarantee the other side is released. So to get Stephen released, Queen Matilda has to give herself up to Bristol Castle so that Stephen is released to go to Winchester, I think it was, but I can't be certain. It was so Winchester. It was, yeah, to go to Winchester so that Robert is released. Robert then goes back to Bristol Castle and Queen Matilda's finally released. So nobody was trusting anybody, but Queen Matilda had managed to arrange all this and by Christmas 1141, she and King Stephen um, had a crown wearing ceremony at Canterbury Cathedral and the whole year, everything was back where they started. And then from 20, 1141 onwards, Matilda played a less prominent role, but she still played an important one in maintaining continental alliances and trying to ease relations between Stephen and the church because Stephen had a bit of falling out with the church. She died in 1142. Her son Eustace died in 1153 and then Stephen died in 1154. Um, he'd lost, with Matil Queen Matilda's death, he'd lost an important um, supporter and a real power behind the throne. She was incredible and she certainly deserves to be the hero of the anarchy because if it wasn't for her, Stephen would have lost everything in 1141. There you go, over to you Paula. <laughs> well, that was a very good case done in, um, yes, done very well. Um, yeah, certainly, <laughs> Matilda sounds like a bit of a gal, really. Um, yeah, she, she sounds, <laughs> yes, she does, she just definitely does. And a lot of women's stuff is really downplayed, isn't it? In, in the, it, it has been like until. You came, you've started this trend now of, of bringing out, you know, telling the world about women's um, in the medieval era, you know, doing a lot more than they weren't just these pretty wallflowers that just sat back and let the men get on with it. But um, yeah, very good. Um, very strong case there. So next up. Oh, and I wanted to say, actually, I've made this little rhyme. William of Eep was a horrible little creep. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it amazing how eat rhymes with creep? I just thought I've got to say that. Don't give right. up the day job, Paula. I uh, definitely won't. No, I, if, I do try to keep going, but I, it falls a bit flat. Um, Carol, it's your turn now. You're going to put the case forward for Brian Fitzcount as being the hero of the anarchy. Take it away. Okay, well, <clears throat> thanks for having me. It's lovely to be here <laughs> with Brian Fitzkind because Brian Fitzkind was one of the most attractive characters of, of the anarchy as well as being very enigmatic. He was born around about 1112, um, maybe a little bit earlier. We don't know exactly his date of birth. His father was Alan IV, the Duke of Brittany who had married a daughter of William the Conqueror first, Constance, and then a daughter of Folk of Anjou. So through his father, he is connected, through his father's wives, he is connected to some of the main players in this story, or this history. However, Brian was illegitimate too. He was another bastard, except he wasn't really a horrible bastard. He was um, absolutely delightful. Um, he was very closely connected to Henry I because Henry I brought him up, or at least he was brought up in Henry I's court as a friend to Henry's son, William, initially. And he was raised at the English court and given the very best education you could possibly have had in the 12th century. And he was incredibly intelligent as well, by all accounts. Um, when Matilda, the Empress, was a child, he would have been a teenager. So there's a little bit of age difference there. He was, however, groomed for life and royal service. 
by Henry I, Matilda's father. His companions, therefore, would have include, included all the main players in the anarchy in the Civil War. And they were all present at Henry I's court. He received the best education that he could possibly be provided with. And Henry, just like he did with Robert, found him a very rich wife. He married the heiress widow Matilda of Wallingford. Now, the thing is that she was at least 15 years older than Brian, possibly 25 years older than Brian, because nobody knows exactly how much older she was, but she was a lot. And they never had any children. Um, but she thought, it is thought that perhaps this marriage was more of a business partnership. There's no evidence, however, of his disloyalty to her. However, Brian was one of Maud, if you like, or the Empress Matilda's most steadfast supporters throughout the anarchy. He was Lord of Wallington and Abergenevy in Wales. And it's hinted, too, that Maud or Matilda the Empress's relationship with Brian was actually a romantic relationship. And a lot of writers of historical fiction like to play that card. However, um, her biographer, uh, Marjorie Chibble, Chibnall, and I believe this as well, that were, they were close, but it was a platonic relationship. It certainly wasn't further than that, I don't think. And because if Maud had taken Brian as a lover, you can imagine it would have totally discredited her. And there is absolutely no hint of scandal concerning any relationship between them in any of the chronicles I've read. He was an honourable man, steadfast and loyal. He initially declared for Stephen like Robert did, but the moment Maud returned to England in 1139, he declared for Maud. The thing was that um, she was, the Empress was pregnant at the time her father had died. She'd also fallen out with her father um, over, uh, uh, over her marriage to Geoffrey's uh, castles that she was supposed to have in Southern Normandy that Henry didn't release. So there was a little bit of falling out between her and her father at that period. But most importantly, she was pregnant with her third child. And she did not come to England and she did not claim the throne of England at that point. However, once Brian, once she did come back to England in, in 39, Brian declared for her and throughout the whole of the anarchy period, the whole 20 years or so, uh, or certainly for 15 of it, he um, defended the most easterly fortress in her control, which was Wallingford Castle. And particularly after the fall of Oxford in 1142 to Stephen, when she made an amazing escape from Oxford Castle in mid-December through the snow and ice and uh, managed to get to Wallingford. And that's another story. And that's a, one of the fascinating stories from, you know, how she managed to do that. Brian Fitzcount wrote to Bishop Henry Stevens' brother, who was a bit of a turncoat, as we'll see. And, and he said in his letter to him, this was after um, Henry, Bishop Henry had declared for Matilda and then changed his mind back to Stephen again. And he said, and he tried to turn other people, Bishop Henry tried to turn other people back to Stephen, or to Stephen. And he said, he wrote, I wish to have a great love of truth and to obey in all things when I can. And I know to the best of my power and knowledge that I do not deserve henceforth to be ranked amongst the faithful. I am sorry for the poor and their plight when the church provides scarcely any refuge for them for they will die if peace is longer delayed. Even so, he still, um, you know, uh, defended Wallingford and supported Matilda. The guest is Stefani says, there was a certain Brian Fitzcount, a man of distinguished birth and splendid position. So he's highly respected in all of the chronicles. I think he was a reign on the worst possible atrocities during this war. He defended Wallingford during several sieges, 
and he helped plan strategy. He was very close to uh, Robert, Matilda's brother, half brother. And as I said, he, he was actually, not only did he receive uh, Matilda whenever she escaped from Oxford, but prior to that, he did help her out of Winchester. He was, he was the person who safely, who got her to safely at the same time as Robert, who brought up the rear, was captured by um, William of Ypres. So he was a very experienced administrator. And I think in the years after, after Winchester and after Oxford, when things were going downhill for, for um, Empress Matilda a little bit, he was very significant in organizing support for Henry, her son, and in also consolidating her hold on the West. He was her, in the past, he'd been her escort to her marriage, Geoffrey in Rouen for her formal betrothal. So he goes back a very long way with the families. He could be um, observed as being a successful emiss emissary, a courtier and an escort, a policy maker as well. He was Carol? an with strong <laughs> political <skills. It's> <laughs> okay. He was auditor of the exchequer in the past. Now, how did it end for Brian? Well, we don't firmly know. He vanishes from the record in 1147, but he probably had died by 1151. So some people, some writers think he entered a monastery. His wife certainly did. And the, it is possible because the Abraghani Chronicle says that he went on crusade and died in Jerusalem. However, by 1147, Robert had died as well. Miles of Hereford, who was another um, strong supporter of the Empress, and along with Robert and Brian, planned strategy. Um, they're all gone. So the field was left after 47 for um, Henry and uh, for, for, for support for, for Henry and for younger people to come on board in the battle for the crime. And I think he was important as a stalwart friend and advisor, much loved by Maud during the years of the anarchy until 1147. And he's one of my favourite historical characters because I admire his intelligence and steadfastness and his loyalty to Maud's cause. And his integrity, most of all. Thank you, Carol. That was very, very good. Very good. A good case there as well, joining the others. Um, mm. Yeah. So um, our next... Candidate is Tony, and you're going to speak for Stephen, Tony. Yes, yes. Um, poor old Stephen. I have to admit, I've always liked him, and I even named my eldest son after him. And when it came to um, this anti discussion, nobody else volunteered to support him. So here goes. <laughs> I'm not hiding tonight. Um, Stephen was a grandson of William the Conqueror, his mother being Adela, Countess of Blois, the Conqueror's daughter, and King Henry's uh, younger sister. Like Henry, Adela had been born in the Pope after William became King of England. And all that added weight to Stephen's authority and possible claim on the throne. Stephen was a model courtier, serving his uncle, Henry I faithfully, witnessing royal documents in the early days, second, after the illegitimate eldest son of Henry, Robert of Gloucester. But later, Stephen was promoted by Henry to the top of the witness list, a clue to how his uncle regarded him. William of Malmesbury tells us that Stephen, by his good nature and the way he jested, and ate in the company of the humblest, earned affection that can hardly be imagined. The jesters, the barney sets, 
that he was a thing acknowledged to be very uncommon among the rich, unassuming, generous, and courteous. Now, when old King Henry died, Stephen showed incredible speed and decisiveness in sailing from Flanders to Dover, then riding from Dover to London to claim the crown, actually following the precedent set by his uncles Rufus and Henry I. Stephen saw how reluctant both England and Normandy would be to accept Queen Regnant. In fact, there wasn't even a word for it because Queen literally meant the King's wife. Matilda couldn't lead men in battle, but Stephen was trained and skilled in warfare, and these were times of constant conflict. When he arrived in London, the citizens were so relieved to have a man in charge. They were filled with excitement and came to meet him with acclamation and joy. The alternative males were the illegitimate Robert of Gloucester or Matilda's detested Angevin husband, Geoffrey of Anjou and neither England nor Normandy wanted him. So Stephen was the best male claimant and the man on the spot. He had the support of the king in his clan and Pope Innocent II agreed, excusing all those, including Stephen himself, who had previously taken oaths of loyalty to support Matilda when old King Henry had forced them, an oath that was forced did not count. In 1136, Stephen uh, proved his worth when he went against David of Scotland, demonstrating the ability to swiftly take men into the field but it was said he was such a kindly and gentle man that he commonly forgot a king's exalted rank. And unfortunately, it became the pattern that others did as well. Now, a king was supposed to listen to his noble advisers, which Stephen did, but unfortunately, their advice often conflicted. During the gates of Baldwind and Redbirds, who held extra castle against the king, Bishop Henry of Winchester advised Stephen to make an example of the rebels. But Robert of Gloucester, who was on the Stephen side still at that time, advised mercy. And Stephen, knowing Baldwin hadn't actually broken his allegiance to him, because he'd never taken um, um, saw that it was a, that it was the best thing to show mercy and technically correct. But as it turned out, it was a bad decision. Stephen's biggest mistake came about later in 1139 because of his chivalrous nature towards women when Matilda first arrived in England and stayed at Arundel Castle, Sussex, with her stepmother, Adeliza of Liva, widow of old King Henry. Now, Stephen surrounded the castle and uh, Adeliza changed her mind, telling Matilda she had to leave. Stephen, at this point, could have taken her prisoner. But this time he listened to the bad advice of his brother, the Bishop of Winchester, and let chivalry prevail. He allowed Matilda to leave unmolested. She went to Bristol to join her half-brother, Robert of Bristol. The Bishop had advised this 
because it was best to have both your enemies in one place. But surely it would have been even better to have eliminated one of your enemies completely. But of course, as we've heard, Stephen's greatest disaster occurred on the 2nd of February, 1141. Two of his most troublesome nobles, Ralph of Chester and his half brother William of Lamar, both had some hereditary claim to Lincoln Castle. Um, and by deceit, they managed to infiltrate the castle and garrison it with their own troops. The people of Lincoln appealed to Stephen the rush to besiege Lincoln Castle. While the siege was in progress, Robert of Gloucester arrived with a much larger army to attack Stephen in the rear. But that morning, Candlemas Day, the king attended mass in Lincoln Cathedral, carrying a candle to present at the old site. That was the tradition. But the flame blew out and the candle broke, an ill omen if ever there was. During the battle that followed, some of Stephen's noblemen actually sent some of their troops to join Gloucester's army, perhaps taking the omen seriously and not wanting to suffer too badly at the enemy's hands if the people was defeated, which he was. Stephen is described as fighting like a lion, breaking his sword and then his battle axe before an enemy soldier hit him on the head with a rock. Stephen was now Gloucester's prisoner. Robert of Gloucester himself, as we've heard, was taken prisoner following the rout to Winchester, and the two men were exchanged on the 1st of November, 1141. Tony. The king was met by cries of rejoicing and exultation that he was restored to the people at the heart, so he was still popular amongst the ordinary folk. Tony, can you wind it up? Okay, yes. <laughs> he goes on, well supported by the London militia, who never quite get a give up on him. And by 1148, he's regained almost all the territory he lost. But then we heard um, Matilda's son, Henry Plantagenet, enters the play. Now, um, Stephen at one point actually pays Henry's troops because Henry can't afford to pay them. But weary of war, Stephen dies on the 25th of October, 1154, and was buried beside his beloved queen in Fathersham Abbey in Kent, which the couple had founded. I think Stephen was a nice guy a chivalrous knight, a popular courtier, and a capable warrior. If he hadn't taken the throne in 1135, and Matilda had either reigned as queen regnant or with her hated husband as King Geoffrey, would the anarchy have been averted? I doubt it. Stephen would have been the rebel's natural leader and a good one. He just didn't have much luck at him. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. A very well put argument there for um, Stephen as being the hero of the anarchy. Um, right, now we better move on to Cathy, um, who's going to speak for Matilda, uh, or Empress Matilda. The Empress, the lady behind yeah. me. Um, yes, very good. <laughs> thanks very much, Paula. Thank you. Uh, it's lovely to be here. I hope you're all still awake and uh, with us and you've made up, not quite made up your mind yet about who the hero or the heroine of the anarchy is, because I have 
quite a bit to tell you about uh, the probably most famous uh, person of the anarchy, if I dare say so, and that's Matilda. Uh, so my heroine of the anarchy is Matilda, also known as Maud, uh, daughter and surviving heiress of Henry I of England. She is daughter of a king. She was queen of the Romans, holy Roman empress, or was she? Countess of Anjou, lady of the English, and eventually Matilda was the mother of a dynasty, a dynasty that we still speak about. Uh, but chroniclers have not been kind to poor Matilda. They called her willful, haughty, proud, and all the attributes that would be praised in a king, but in a mere woman, just, no, can't have that. So that's why I am firmly in team Matilda. During the anarchy, she faced many dangers bravely, uh, such as fleeing Oxford Castle in midwinter, as uh, Carol had mentioned. And she had a few near misses when she was almost caught, uh, such as Arundel or Winchester as well. And uh, she was very fortunate. She had a lot of luck in her time, but also had to face quite a few stressful occasions. Now, many women, kind of those weak and feeble women, would have succumbed to a fit of the vapours and uh, let the men do the stuff, but not so her. And her decisions weren't always wise, but they were made because she was convinced of her right to the throne. Yet she did not falter and she never gave up, even though she retired to Normandy after Robert's death, Robert of Gloucester's death, uh, she still had one more ace up her sleeve, and that was her son, Henry. Matilda was a woman of great intelligence and experience in administration over many, many years. But uh, is it ultimately that her lack in people skills led to her downfall? In my mind, there's little doubt that Matilda was all of the above, both full, haughty, proud. Uh, and she would have liked, likely wondered why, if she'd been born a male, she'd have been the, made the ideal medieval king. Yet as a woman, legitimate daughter of a king, she was vilified for her confidence her belief in her divine right to rule, and her often stubborn decisions that at times defied social norms of the day. So she stepped on some people's toes and they didn't like it. But just how did a young Anglo-Norman heiress turn into a veritable virago? <laughs> well, I believe the answer lies firmly in her early life. Uh, so let me take you back in time, a little less about the anarchy itself, a bit more about Matilda's background. She was likely born in February 1102, and she was still a very young girl, primary age, uh, in our time when her father negotiated a highly lucrative marriage alliance with um, King Henry Heinrich V um, of the German Salian dynasty. Um, and her dowry was about 10,000 marks in silver. Now, that was a lot of money. Her husband to be needed the money. Her father wanted his a firm foothold on the uh, kind of European continental market uh, there to, to be on a par with the other kings. Um, he'd established himself. So that's what the alliance was about. Um, and a few years before uh, the agreement, her husband-to-be had unseated his father. Uh, for a while, they ruled alongside each other, but um, eventually he managed to get his father uh, set aside, and he already, already, her husband already held the title of King of the Romans at that point. And the Salians were a fascinating family. I uh, read a lot about them in my teens. Um, and their cathedral in Speyer in southwest Germany, um, where Henry's remains are buried, is spectacular. It's an amazing building. It's still uh, very, very close to what it was a thousand years ago, so well worth a visit. I've been a few times, sadly, I haven't found any photos that I took many years ago, but it's well worth a visit. Um, Matilda moved to Germany about eight, at about eight years of age and was anointed and crowned Queen of the Romans on the 25th of July, 1110. And their actual wedding, a magnificent event that was well attended by many noble princes uh, from many, many kind of houses, royal houses, was eventually celebrated on the 7th January 1114. Now, at that point, she was still not even 12 years old. Uh, she was already queen. Uh, she would have had a big household. Um, she um, signified uh, power already and not even 12 years old. So you can see 
um, that it was quite remarkable. Many marriages were forged at that age, but not every woman married at 12 became a queen at that young age. Um, equally remarkable was her life in Germany. Her husband was about 16 years older. And he was a rebellious character, as we've seen with his father. Uh, he was also always quarreling with the church, as had his father, over the subject of investiture. And this saw him excommunicated again and again. Um, and it was a serious power struggle between the Roman kings and the Holy Roman Empress and the Pope, which went on for ages, uh, for centuries, really. Uh, and Henry was not one to give in easily. Uh, so he seemed to have been quite a stubborn character. So maybe his behavior had an effect on young, impressionable girl like Matilda, who was still kind of, at that time, forming her own character. Uh, don't forget, she is still a young girl at that point. She learned very early on about the responsibility her titles bring with it, and she was highly educated. Her husband insisted on her receiving the best education in terms of uh, administration, law, um, and all the, the input languages, all the important things that she needed. Uh, and she grew into a capable administrator in charge whenever he was away, which was quite often. Um, and all that when she wasn't even 18 years old, not exactly what Western kids these days have to deal with. So in 1116, still in the mid-teens, she and Henry traveled to Italy in pursuit of the Pope. They call it again, yes, you guessed. Um, and, um, but the couple were warmly welcomed everywhere. They went to Venice and um, the northern cities, Bologna, I think as well. Um, and she must have seen that as a confirmation of her status. She was at that point, Queen of the Romans and possibly in line with her husband's ambitions, saw herself as rightful empress, holy Kathy, woman empress. Hmm? Kathy, we're going to have to wind it up a little. Or, already? Gosh, okay. Because I, I get that you've got quite a bit to say, so I thought I'd come in a bit earlier. Thank you. <laughs> um, she remained in Italy uh, after her husband went back and uh, she judged cases of law, signed charges and adjudicated disputes. So she was very responsible and still not even 20 years old. Um, so I'm sure that she was convinced of her right, um, of her status in the world. And even given a young age, um, I think that is something that stayed with her throughout her life. Um, so it's maybe not surprising that following her return, she was called haughty and proud because that's what she was brought up to be. She was um, the most important empress. In, at the time in Europe. Um, so she had a very strong sense of her own importance and a strong dose of determination. So maybe that's why she believed that the oath that the nobles took, um, accepting her as her father's heir to the throne, was binding before God. Uh, they would have known of her experience in Germany and she would not have seen anything amiss. So when Henry died, perhaps for me, that might be a reason why she didn't rush to get crowned because she expected it. It's what she had been due in Italy, in Germany. Um, so maybe she expected that and that's, that might go a long way in explaining why she didn't rush and Stephen had his chance. And so when the treachery happened, his uh, and the English nobilities and including Roberts, that must have stung. So she would have been quite angry and disappointed, I guess. Um, so, Ending up a mere countess with a young husband she detested and betrayed by her cousin, um, she, she must have been quite, quite furious and quite angry. Uh, so I can see that she would have put everything she had into getting her right, getting the throne of England, becoming the queen. And when that eventually didn't work out after all her adventures, and trials and tribulations, she still had that final ace up her sleeve, her son Henry. And um, so the ultimate triumph would be hers, even if, if it may have been tinged with a sense of what if. Uh, so I think Matilda deserves to be the heroine of the anarchy, just as she deserved to be Queen of England in her own right. So I hope our audience tonight will agree with me. Go team Matilda. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Kathy, that was brilliant. Um, yeah, you 
kind of you know because I've I've often thought about but not really particularly liked the way that she comes across but mm-hmm. you you gave some really good arguments there about you know this made me think a little bit more dif- differently about her you know and her reasons and and recalling that she had quite a brutal marriage with uh Jeffrey and he was he was quite brutal towards her yeah and um that couldn't have that must have shaped the way that she managed mm. men herself I guess as well you know there's a lot lot there to think about um yeah. so, so thank you panelists for your um fantastic um yeah stalwart um sticking up for your um your candidates it was really really good about well, all of them are really good and I really think that you know there was a lot there's a lot there that you put across and you've all done really well for your people um I guess now um we're gonna have uh questions for each of you from from each other so maybe um perhaps instead of you know to save a bit of time perhaps if um Sharon would you like to ask who would you like to ask questions of rather than everybody ask everyone (laughs) maybe you you know everyone just ask one person I don't I don't think I've got any because I think everybody um explained their heroes really well I still think I would go Queen Matilda even though I'm on Empress Matilda's side um, actually there, there's a good question which side of the anarchy would you have been on would you have been on your hero side because like I said I would have been on the Empress's side despite the fact that I think Queen Matilda was incredible and I'm a supporter of the Warrens. I think they were wrong being supporting Stephen. Um, so whose side would you have been on? So who would you ask that question of? Everybody. <laughs> just to, <laughs> Stephen oh, the idea was just to ask one person. <laughs> I know, but I want to know. Stephen or Matilda? <laughs> Matilda. And you too, Paula. <laughs> um, Stephen. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we forgot about John um, Marshall. Actually, he was. Well, a bit of he, 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 I mean, he didn't play a big part, did he? Yeah, but he had no, 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 I know, I know that, I know that. Yeah. He comes in much later into the story, really. Yeah. He, he yeah. is more prominent um, during that yeah. period when Matilda was consolidating her power in the West yeah. uh, for her, her son Henry. And, yeah. and during Henry's um, fight. Carol, let's just. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Stephen or Matilda? Who Me. side would you be on? Yeah, I would, I would absolutely be on Matilda's side. Um, I think there's certain things that Stephen did that really bothered me. Uh, I think he was a nice guy, probably. Um, but he, I mean, I, 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 I'm concerned about things like he tried to stop the Archbishop of Canterbury and three bishops from, um, this was uh, later on in 1148, from actually going to a conference in, Ru- in uh, Reims. Yeah. He tried to stop them doing that. And um, the, Archbishop himself, the Archbishop himself sneaked across the channel and actually stood up for Stephen at that conference. Yeah, so. We only wanted a yes or a Matilda or a Stephen, but that's brilliant. Oh, I thought you wanted my reasons, okay. Yeah, um, no, we're really um, sure well, on it's Matilda, it's Matilda for me. I could give lots of reasons why, but it is Matilda. Mm-hmm. Derek? Uh, Robert? No, Stephen <laughs> or Matilda. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather not have either of them, actually. You're but, so uh... like a man, aren't you? Really? Uh, yeah, actually, I agree with you there. I agree yes, with me you. too. <laughs> me yeah. too, yeah. <laughs> they caused a lot of problems for the yeah. ordinary people who they didn't give a damn about. That's right. really had yeah. to suffer. They got it from both sides, didn't they? The poor peasants. And they anyway, would have got a good king. T- Tony? Yes, they would have to be Stephen. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Stephen, Stephen. Yeah, nice guy, peasants like Stephen. <laughs> As a peasant. Oh. <laughs> right, do, we, do we have any documentation, uh, e- evidence that the peasants liked him? <laughs> um, well, yes, the um, uh, both William at Malmesbury and the Chestnuts stood party. Oh, I don't know. If I and, you know, that the common people supported him whenever possible. Okay. Now, whether they're just... They probably weren't the ones that had their crops burnt. Not sure I agree. <laughs> they probably weren't the ones that had, had their crops burnt. 
So, right, so that's, um, there, there we are. Well, can I just say something about that, Paula? Can I just say this one thing about that? During that period, after Winchester, uh, after Oxford, whenever Matilda was consolidating her power in the West, there was an awful lot less famine and a lot more um, productiveness and, and peace in those Western territories that she controlled, Wiltshire, mm -hmm. Berkshire, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, further west towards Bristol, than anything that Stephen was able to, cons you know, yeah. consolidate piecewise in his territories. So there That's was the family. cobbling nobles all the time. Well, Stephen was taking over churches and, and yeah. making fortresses off them and that kind of thing, you know, and the, uh, people did depend on, I mean, the church could be pretty shitty at times, but people did depend on, on um, you know, the monasteries and so on and so yeah. forth in various ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's a fair point. That's really a fair point. So we've got some um, questions in the chat. Let me just check the... Uh, Amy Mantravadi has um, asked a question. Who was the greatest villain? Henry of Winchester, William mm -hmm. of... Ypres. Uh, uh, yeah, William Ypres the Creep, or um, <laughs> Jeffrey the Mandeville. Can oh. I ask you that uh, question, yeah. Sharon? Sharon. <laughs> Sharon. Oh. <laughs> we'll answer that one. Oh my God, Jeffrey the Mandeville. Oh well, he was a bit of a yeah. He turned in well into a villain in the end because um, Stephen gave him the Earldom of Lincoln, and then he sort of turned against Stephen, and he died whilst in rebellion against Stephen. Mm. William. Ypres was supporting Stephen and well he was a soldier I mean soldiers always go yeah. way too far basically and who was yeah. the other one? Jeffrey de Mandeville. No, no Henry of Winchester. Winchester. Oh, Henry, Henry, of, yeah. yeah I'd go with the Bishop of Winchester because he was Stephen's brother who changed <coughs> sides when it looked like Stephen was losing yeah. and changed sides mm -hmm. again when it looked like Stephen might win because of Queen Matilda so yeah. and I do not like Henry of Winchester, to be mm. honest. You find him, he's just like one of those, oh yeah, I'll name, name you Lady of England of the English. Um, even though you got my brother in prison, it's like, wow, way to go being a loyal brother. So yeah, I've mm. got for Henry of Winchester. <laughs> okay. And Bandit, um, Bandit Queen, um, she's asking, was um was Matilda driven out of London because she asked, well, she asked for taxes to lots of taxes, which was mm. her right as queen at the time. Um, if a man had, you know, if a king had done that, um, it would have been OK. W was she prejudiced against, do we think, um, yeah. because she was a woman? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that one problem was they'd already paid their taxes. To yes. That's right, absolutely, and and she was doubling them. Yeah. yeah, it was more like a punishment than a tax. It was more yeah. like a fine. And having said For that, support, there yeah. have been um, men, quite a few men, who have lost their lives. I mean, you know, who have been. Um, rebelled against because they asked for taxes so I don't know that it was because she was a woman I think she they just you know could have been I mean but on the other hand I think she definitely was you know not not necessarily about the taxes um but she probably was prejudiced quite a bit you know because um yeah, yeah. I think yeah. so and her lack of people skills, as I called it, might have, uh, especially in that episode in London, um, really shown her up um, because she was, uh, as an empress, like maybe not used too. to ordinary folks. She was not used to ordinary yeah. things. And um, she would have seen it within her right uh, to raise taxes uh, as a retribution or whatever. And of course, she didn't like the Londoners for yeah. obvious reasons. Um, so, but on the other hand, would they have been as nasty towards a man if there had been a man in, you know, some man battle experienced? Well, been look, sitting, what happened, uh, look what happened to Tosti, though, you know, back um, talking about men and taxes. Look what happened to Tosti Godwinson. I mean, he was exiled completely mm -hmm. out of the country. So I'm not sure it was because... Mm. 
whether the argument can be used in that the particular thing is, circumstance. With the Empress, circumstances um, changed. The, the thing is with the Empress and the haughtiness, there was there was a really good example um, where they said that um, she was in a hall and her half illegitimate half brother walked in and David, King of Scots, and she didn't stand up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. because and if it had been Henry the First that these two men have walked into the room to see, he would have stayed sat down. But because it was Empress Matilda, a woman, yeah, she was expected to stand up, even yeah. though she saw herself as in exactly the same position as Henry the First, and not yeah. would not have believed herself to mm -hmm. necessary to stand up. But they expected it because she was a woman, and they were men. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I think in London there, there was it was a bit more specific than just taxes because one of the first things right. Stephen did at the beginning of his reign was to give London what was called commune status, which yeah. gave them an element of independence and uh, freedom of trade. And um, they sort of accepted the demand from Matilda for tax, but when it became clear that she didn't seem to be approving of their status, and it looked as if she was going to withdraw that status. That's when they felt there was a real threat to London and the prosperity of London. Um, because remember, when you're talking about Londoners, you're not talking about tanners and weavers and so on. You're talking about merchants, mm -hmm. the people who are actually the movers and shakers. Yeah. And uh, they were disgruntled about that more than anything else, mm. I think. Mm. Yeah, don't forget that she lost quite a lot of support from, you know, I think he's despicable too, but Henry of Winchester, because she would not agree to allowing Eustace to inherit Boulogne. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Which, yeah. Uh, yeah. Also got, you know, once she lost Henry's support, you've got Henry, I mean, he really was wily. I mean, mm -hmm. he persuaded other people yeah. back into yeah. Stephen's cab. So the combination of that and the combination of the... Um, the fact that uh, she also made an appointment in Durham, which favoured, in fact, her um, her uncle, the King of Scotland, his candidate, he she put him forward as Bishop of Durham, Durham where, when mm -hmm. nobody else wanted that. Yeah. So she wouldn't listen to advice. No. So there were various other things that came in, appointment that she made that was unfortunate. Um, the whole thing about, you know, not allowing Eustace to inherit uh, Boulogne, and losing uh, completely, which may have been no loss, really, but mm. Henry of Winchester, but I think it was strategy-wise, a loss. Thank you, Carol. That's that's a good point. Good point. Um, Charlie's got a um, question for the panel, um, and one that I've been thinking about as well, because I, I really love this. I'm very fond of this story, too, about the Newbury Castle siege, where... Um, Charlie says she has, she has a, a soft spot for Stephen because of the Newbury Castle incident with little William Marshall. Oh, what mm. credence do the panellists give to this story? It actually did happen, I think. I think it's true. Yeah. I, th I think that really did happen. That comes much later, and I think Stephen did feel quite confident at that point, um, even though Henry was getting quite a lot of support from the younger generation. Mm -hmm. um you know between 48 let's say and 54 um mm -hmm. so you know he was back a couple of times to england and and um of course the the war was going on but stephen i think did feel quite um strong all the same i think sorry i do think that he did um that, that the story is true yes yeah the story oh. about um no. by john yeah, marshall hanging Gouts. john john marshall, marshall. John Marshall says, um, I've, I'll, don't worry about slinging him over in the uh, of Henry Henry Channel, Channel, whatever it was. Yeah. yeah, the catapult. Just catapult him over. I don't care. I've got, I've got the hammer and anvil. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 yeah. Was the Marshall, that was the Marshall's thing, you know, the hammer and anvils. Yeah. That was yeah. his um, sig um, insignia to some extent. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it's a lovely story, isn't it, that... Um, 
that King Stephen felt sorry for them. I bet, but you don't hear of any other stories like that though happening. So probably was quite a while. Well, he was he was mentioned to have been what, to to all accounts and um, records a genuinely nice guy, which yeah. often makes bad kings. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can't really be a nice guy and be completely and utterly ruthless. And that's yeah. why he let Matilda escape and let others loot off uh, the hook as well. Because yeah. he had, maybe he had a caring nature. Maybe he was just a very affable guy who he was very charming. didn't want to yeah. hurt. And he didn't want to hurt children. So obviously, um, for him, that, that was one example. Yeah. I think that was his character a bit. Uh, and that's, that's probably the only nice thing I'll say about Stephen, but uh, um, he had this reputation. And I think that there's, there's quite a bit of truth behind it. Derek, do you look like you wanted to say something there, did you? Uh, no, I've just woken up actually. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what, what you? No, I had, I, well, I've been thinking about something all the way through that, that, that it's sort of an elephant in the room really, that we've not mentioned at any point or only touched on. And that's the, the situation in Normandy, because the, the kingdom we're looking at at that time was unlike anything that people would understand today, because essentially it was two places, England and Normandy. Mm -hmm. Barons had lands in both for, for, for in many cases. The mm -hmm. king had a, a hand in both, as it were. And basically, Stephen lost Normandy to Geoffrey of Anjou. And mm -hmm. that was a death knell for Stephen, How, whatever he did, mm -hmm. because none of the barons wanted these two places to be ruled by different people yeah. and in the person of young henry they had someone who would inherit or had inherited mm -hmm. in fact uh, normandy uh, yeah. along with a few other places he managed to grab uh, and who could then be king of england and unite the whole area so i yeah. think in those terms it's something we've not touched on but it's actually mm -hmm. a really important aspect of the whole period yeah how people viewed normandy uh, as a part of the kingdom, if you like, or a yeah. part of the, the empire. Yeah, I agree with Derek. And you also have that bit with the Beaumont twins, which mm -hmm. are a prime example. I mean, they're twins, so they're to equal. But you had Wolleran and Robert, and Wolleran would end up going to Normandy and siding with Geoffrey and then Henry for a little while because they mm. were trying to protect their Norman yeah, lands. Yeah. So you had Robert on Stephen's side in England yeah. and Wolleran on the other side in Normandy just so that they kept their lands. And you had a lot of barons doing that. The Warrens mm. sent a younger son over to look after the Warren lands so that they kept their lands in Normandy as well as in England. And it was mm. it was a big part of the plans. Each baron had to look after his own lands as before he decided whether he was on Stephen or Matilda's side. So we've got some more questions anyway. Um, so uh, Bandit Queen again um, was talking about um, what was the question? What was Henry trying to achieve by invading England when he was 14 and had to be rescued by Stephen because he <laughs> ran out of money? <laughs> I think he was being a typical teenager. <laughs> boys with the boys. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. some great stories in this, isn't there? I think he would have well, probably inherited his mother's confidence. Yeah, and, no, I don't uh, think his yeah. mother or, or yeah. his um, uncle were too much in approval of that little escapade no, totally, at all. Totally. And they didn't give him any money and they didn't have the yeah. ready cash, yeah. I mean, to give him yeah. any way to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's another really example of Stephen's nice character, isn't it? Tony, do you want to say something about that? strategy. Yes, he did, he did actually pay Henry's troops for him. I think Henry was just, you know, a typical teenager. He yeah. uh, wanted to make his mark and assert himself. Yeah. Um, but going back to the William Marshall incident, I actually read somewhere, I don't know if it was invented, but the Stephen played with four yes. years William yeah. Marshall on the floor. Yeah, yeah. Cutting horses and knights and giving him rides on his back. So I think that mm. shows, you know, it was good for kids as well. I think I read that in the novel. <laughs> I'm not sure yeah, I I'm think thinking. it's in the Jester. I think it's in the Jester Stefani. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. I think it, it, it definitely, he definitely did, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and there's some more questions. I think there's a, just a few more now. Um, Amy says, uh, John Marshall lost an eye in the fighting around Winchester trying to protect the Empress retreat. I think that was when he it got was in the burned, burning church. wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. lead from the roof the melted yeah. and dropped down. And on his and, face. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and he walked home. Yeah. He walked home. He walked miles to... He waited for the um, for Queen Matilda's soldiers to leave. He basically stayed in a burning church until the enemy had left, and then he walked. They they assumed everybody in the church was dead, and he basically played dead and then walked out and went home. <laughs> yeah, with his face. They waited for the heat to die down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> As you do. Thank you, As you do. I'm sure he managed to get a horse on the way back, actually. I don't believe that he walked the whole way because there were plenty of horses running free after that ride, at that, you know, after Winchester. Yeah, yeah. So good it was point pretty here. Good point. Pretty it just sounds more heroic to walk. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I'm afraid in my novel I give him a horse. So. Oh, that's very <laughs> kind. <laughs> Support leaving Werewell on a horse, or at least getting a horse yeah. fairly nearby. Yeah, nice. Mm -hmm. Just one more, I think. Um, Charlie saying, I, th I think Charlie, you mean? Um, do you want to take your microphone off, Charlie? I, Shall I put it on just, full view. Just to ask that. Can you turn your microphone on, Charlie? Bottom left. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So you, well, well, you were saying I'm about his character. I up on my earlier question, which was, you know, if, if as Carol said, that this came later, the, the William Marshall Castle incident. But um, if we believe this was his character, does this reflect well on the way that we view him and, and his past deeds and things? Or do we sort of want to see him in sort of medieval kinginess? You know, how do, how do we actually view him in the light of the fact that he's kind of really sweet, you know, I didn't get that. No, I up. Yeah, you were breaking up That's a little bit. But I think what Charlie's up. trying to say is, um, if we believe that his character was this nice person, mm -hmm. is that right, Charlie? Stephen, or, he was this or nice. how does Stephen. this reflect? Um, does this reflect well on the way we view him and his past? Who's this, Stephen or, or John Marshall? Stephen. Stephen. Well, I think Stephen was a nice guy. And on the whole, nice guys do not make efficient medieval kids. <laughs> so I think it's, um, you know, yeah. you couldn't really be. I, I honestly don't think he was that nice. I mean, I think that he, he was um, very, I mean, there were nice things to bite him. But everybody's got nice, good and bad. But um, when I think about, um, well, I don't mind that he imprisoned de Mandeville because I think de Mandeville is pretty despicable. But um, mm -hmm. what about Ranulph of Chester? I mean, he um, oh, yeah, yeah. was <laughs> really quick to accuse him of treason on the basis of what other people said to him. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, that's a very strong ally. I mean, Ranulph of Chester uh, had real good control of the North. Yeah. And that was why Matilda wanted him back. And, and he did come back. He did come back to support Matilda. Mm -hmm. in, uh, um, in the uh, later years. But um, the, I mean, when you think about it, going right up the west, right into Chester and, and further north, I mean, it's important. And Stephen was not prepared to give him any troops to go and keep the Welsh at uh, bay. And then Stephen's advisor said to him, or the other barons that Stephen was close to, said to him, well, run off the Chester, don't trust him. You know, mm -hmm. don't, don't trust him. But yeah, it, it was important to have those borders um, you know, protect it as well. Yeah. So I think Stephen miscalculated. I think Stephen made a lot of miscalculations, unfortunately. Well, Stephen mm -hmm. yeah. had gone and uh, worked along the Welsh marches. He mm -hmm. would be walking straight into the enemy's camp. It was a very silly place to go. Mm -hmm. um, so well, I think he was better off sticking to the East of England. Well, I don't know. I think he could have given help to protect, you know, to protect um, along those marches, at least around the Chester area. But that's, you know, that, that's a mute point, really. But anyway, he, did, he decided that the point was that instead of just saying no, he decided that Ranulph was a traitor. And there's no proof necessarily that Ranulph would not have supported him had he yeah. been a little bit more... Um, Charitable and not chucked him in prison and gives him a treasure and to get his to get Lincoln back from him, to get his castles from him and his Kent castles and wherever. 
Yeah. Or wherever else Randolph had castles. I don't think he had any in Kent, but you know, wherever else Randolph had castles, he was mm-hmm. getting those from him. Yeah. I actually think there's a lot to like about Stephen, um, but I think he was in the wrong line of business, really. Um, mm-hmm. In Norman times, I mean, you, you had to be ruthless, but you also had to be quite clever. And I don't think he was quite savvy enough in his dealings with his barons, both those that were on his side and those who weren't. That's, um, right. yeah. that's the way I would I'm, see him. I, I, I don't agree. think, though, that, I mean, this just my point of view, um, if I'm allowed to say, uh, um, that he did, the things that Stephen did, if you compare them to things that Edward I did, for example, or, you know, um, some of the earlier, like Henry I as well, um, maybe he wasn't that bad, but I'm just um, just trying to think, who else? Henry, Henry VIII, if you compared with what Stephen did to, you know, the the kind of, despicable things that I don't think he was that bad really I don't think he was yeah, well the difference bad. between him and Edward the first uh, for a start is that Edward the first had a consistent vision and Edward uh, Edward the first did not get but that doesn't make you a bad person didn't they just say that well as None a person it's, a, it's very difficult None to say exactly kings. what sort of people they were yeah. none of those kings disowned their own son <laughs> Stephen disowned his own son to give Henry the throne but that, you know, he was forced into that wow. position. He was forced into that position, and Eustace wasn't a particularly nice person. No. But Jack would but, never but have Eustace. The church he spent nineteen years fighting for this crown. He'd spent nineteen years fighting to make sure he kept this crown. Yeah. <laughs> but Stephen didn't put women in cages oh, and adopted Henry. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Okay, well, that you know, maybe that makes him a bit of a dick. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. A lot of the things he did, you would it's say, so were honourable. He was honourable, except for, in the start of it, he betrayed a note that he'd made to make Empress Matilda Queen. Yeah. And he disowned his own son. But he was... But, Stephen, but what, look at what William the Conqueror did, and look what um, Edward the First did. That he put women in cages. You know, well, how could, at least they couldn't be much worse than that. I, I don't think we can compare. <laughs> I don't think you can compare uh, as such. Yeah, I agree. I don't think you can compare. Um, He's kind of better or worse than others because no. uh, he's got his good points. Um, even Edward I had some of his good points. And he loved I, his um, <laughs> sorry, he loved his family. <laughs> he loved his family, exactly. Uh, the chairing crosses and all that, uh, he what he did. Dogs. So he ha- also had a good side, even though yeah, I don't think totally it's just said. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think in the grand scheme of things, he wasn't that bad. <laughs> Tony. Well, how many people die, ordinary people died because Stephen usurped the throne? Yeah. I don't know. Was it, is there and a he started back? a war, you know. He started, he started a he war, started pretty a much, war. yeah. yeah <laughs> exactly. Did, yeah, so. But look what also, the did. He and killed also, let's just go back to this. He starved thousands of people in the north. You know, that's far worse, that I, I can think. And he dis- disowned, he dispossessed people. He, um, you know... So did Stephen. Sorry? Yeah. So did Stephen. Stephen did, big time. <laughs> there are a lot there, of dispossessed was... barons who went over to Matilda. Yeah, there were That's... actually barons at the Battle of Lincoln. There was a force at the Battle of Lincoln on Robert of Gloucester's side that were called the Disinherited because Stephen had disinherited right. them all. Yeah. <laughs> and the yeah. entire force were called the Disinherited. Mm-hmm. Well, the disinherited that were the Anglo-Saxon disinherited mostly died from being disinherited. I think what Bandit Queens there has flashed up is quite true, by the way. Having researched Edward I quite thoroughly, I would say that that's true. They weren't in they weren't in the cages all day, were they, and all night? So I think he, he did put no, he did put them in cages, and they yeah. were in cages for something like four or five years before they were moved to other places. But they weren't in cages on the walls outside castles. They were in cages within rooms within the yeah. castles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they, were rooms, in cage, right. they were caged. That's yeah. what she thinks, isn't it? 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Can we get to the votes, Paula? <laughs> but, but I want to go back. Can okay. I make a point? I'm supposed exactly. to be keeping order here. I'm yeah. Come on. Paula, Paula, can I make the point that one of Matilda's strengths, as opposed to Stephen, is that she had two, two or three very strong men behind her. Strong woman, and that's great. But she had great advisors, and she had men of integrity behind her. Mm -hmm. More so, I think, than did Stephen. Stephen. She um, had Brian Fitzcarraldo, who was just absolutely wonderful. He was such a good administrator during those years was, when she was yeah. holding on to the West. And then he Incredibly had to be loyal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Stephen's yeah. strength was Queen Matilda. Robert. <laughs> yeah, I think she inspired more loyalty in those close around her than Stephen did, because uh, did. as we know, the parents were mostly looking out for their own advantage, they, all, especially yeah, when they had problems on they? both sides at the time. Something like Brian Fitzcarraldo wasn't looking out for any own advantage. He yeah. refused. He didn't want when she was rewarding right, left, and centre. He didn't want any reward. He right. didn't give Avergani to. He gave that away to Miles. Mm. You know, he didn't. He wasn't looking for uh, to his best. No. Um, that was loyal. Uh, that is good. Right, right. Best we better round yeah. this up because we need to do the voting now. So, <laughs> um, if everybody could turn their cameras back on, if you're still here. <laughs> and you're not pretending. Find that everybody okay. eating their tea. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is just, um, I think the way that we did it last time with the um, Bayer Tapestry is that we asked people to raise their hands for um, their, the people that they... I'm, I'm, I'm going to use both names. So if we go, first of all, if we um, have a vote for the hero of the anarchy first, um, who... Who thinks and you can only vote once? That right? Yeah, <laughs> only vote once. So, who <laughs> votes for Derek and Robert of Gloucester? Can we vote? Yes, I think yeah, so. I assume you vote for your own person. I'll for Robert of Gloucester. Oh, I'll vote for Robert then. <laughs> can you put your, no, the, the hands? Sorry, there is a little tool that uh, oh. I think it's in the application. I don't know where the tool is. Is it uh, the applications? Or What's more. This? Hold on. I, I don't know where that tool is. Reactions? Is yeah, reactions. reactions. Yes. Down hands. the bottom. Next to the record button. Mm -hmm. yeah. Down the bottom, there is like a, yeah, if you put your hover over there. I want to lose my There is a little here. face called um, <laughs> reactions. And you can my put, if you, everyone who wants to vote for Derek, please put a thumbs up. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just going to put my or thumb a hand up. up. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Open it, there's more on the I can't find that little thing. I can't find it. But I'm it voting for at the bottom on the menu at the bottom. Um, well, my my mouse is not working. Ah, okay. Put your hand up physically then, if you can't. Okay, I'm putting my hand up physically. <laughs> One, two, three, uh, I think four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, Sharon, you haven't got your hand up. No, One, I two, haven't. Three, four, I'm five, 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 <laughs> nine, ten. Uh, looks like nine to me. Is that right, everyone? Five, nine, six, seven, three, eight. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine, yeah. yeah. Nine. Nine. And me, so that's mm -hmm. ten. I'm voting for him. Uh, who, mm, right, everyone close those steps those down now close yeah. down your hand you need to lower hand lower hand julie can you julie it's reactions isn't it where you find this yeah julie. it's reactions. reactions yeah so you've got to lower your hand now yeah julie mine's can you lower your hand that's it well done um so who is going to vote for sharon and matilda of boulogne me <laughs> well, she's <laughs> voting for herself <laughs> You can't vote for yourself, I'm sorry. No, <laughs> take that hand on, Sean Connery. All right, yeah. you voted for himself? I did, you said we could vote for ourselves. All right, you can vote for yourself then. Oh, I just meant, can we vote? That's all, I'm not voting for myself. I voted for, you know, I mean, Brian's got such integrity. Why would he vote for himself? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just expects everybody else to love him. <laughs> And who's going to vote for Carol? Oh, Lisa and Lisa, can you put your hand down? Lisa, hand down. I oh, just won't count. Yeah. So 
who's voting now for Carol and Brian? Oh, no, not one. No. Oh, for Brian. Oh, oh, nice. oh, oh nice. we've got votes. <laughs> Carol, Carol. Wonderful. wonderful. Got two votes there. Lovely if we had Brian. a single transferable oh. vote, he would have got mine. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, he's a pretty nice guy. What do you mean? Yeah. And a very good administrator and a very yeah. good fighter, too. He was. And very right. Who's voting for Stephen? Oh, <laughs> Tony. Tony's voting for Stephen. Tony's voting for Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. What? Well, look, you put them all off. <laughs> <laughs> no, she made a very good case. So. And who's, she did, yeah. And yeah. who's voting for <laughs> Kathy <laughs> and Matilda? Empress Matilda. John. Well, that's one for Matilda. So the two. Thank you. <laughs> so it looks like Derek and John. Uh, no, sorry, John. John. <laughs> Derek and Robert have won that round. So well done. Well done. Well, well, well done, Derek. <laughs> Why haven't I been allowed to vote for Queen Matilda? Who said that? Sorry, you could Rob do. Just said, Nobody asked me to vote for Queen Matilda. You didn't have to. No, they did. Yes, we did. Yeah. Did you vote you for her? Man? I'll add your vote to Queen Matilda. She's still only got two votes. <laughs> I'm afraid, Roger. No, what about not. the Empress? Was she? Now I'm getting muddled between Queen Matilda and the Empress. Oh, did you do a vote for the Empress? Yes. Yeah, Derek. we just did that. Derek. Just the last <laughs> vote was for the Empress. That was the last one. Queen, the only okay. honourable one was the lot. My yes. vote was for Stephen. Sorry, I couldn't find oh, my right okay. hand. That's all right. <laughs> okay, so Stephen's got two and Matilda's got two. And um, oh, Brian's Matilda got O'Brien two. and Brian yeah. got two. So all the others had two. And Derek, actually, what, how many? There's, that doesn't add up, really. <laughs> <laughs> Too many oh, hands. Somebody has. But I think I, I think Robert's the runaway winner somehow. Yeah, I, I agree. agree. I think so. He yeah. I'm to be shocked. Runaway he winner. He <laughs> so is it? Is there any point in me asking the audience? Can I? Um, can I change my vote, please? I want to put my vote from Robert to the Empress Matilda. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll allow Lovely. that because Derek still won. Anyway. Still <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Thank you. That, is there any point in me asking the audience if you would <laughs> have been on Stephen's side or Matilda's side? I think the, oh, yes. the answer is obvious, isn't it? Well, ask are we. Okay. Let them like, who would been, Let's who, find out. Who from the audience would have been on Matilda's side? Okay. So we need hands again. Oh, we're doing well, Team Matilda. Come on, Derek. <laughs> Am I allowed to vote? Yeah. <laughs> yes, and I'm for Matilda as well, so that's not nice. way. That's how I found my little thingy. Thank Thank Matilda. You. Stephen? You have to find this. Until everyone's We need to lower hands. Yeah. Reactions. Oh, yeah, raised hand. Raised hand. Yeah, but Carol, are you on Stephen's side now then? No, I'm on Matilda's side. <laughs> Lower your hand. You do not have blue. Paula has moved on. <laughs> yeah, see, so Matilda wins. By the way, yeah. Thank okay. you. Yay, yeah, the Thank you, Robert. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. everybody, that was so much fun. Thank you very much. It was brilliant. It was really good. I hope you all enjoyed it. It's great fun. <laughs> it was very good lovely. one. We'll have to say good night now, I think. So it just leaves me to thank the panel, um, Sharon, Carol, Derek, Tony and Kathy, and you all for coming along and staying. Um, oh, we're down. Yeah, staying, staying the, the, to the end of, of the course. show. So <laughs> the end of the show. Is that what we are? <laughs>